Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Leading Australian scientist Tim Flannery recently spoke before a packed crowd at the Lenzik Theater in Santa Fe, New Mexico, as part of Readings and Conversations, a series sponsored by the Lannan Foundation. Today, Tim Flannery's speech on the environment, how human activity is altering the Earth's climate, and what we can do to save it. Before he took to the stage, I introduced Tim Flannery. He is a paleontologist, a mammalogist, has discovered 70 species of marsupials, rodents, bats. His work is remarkable. He calls himself an environmental historian. In 1980, he discovered dinosaur fossils just this year. He was awarded one of the highest honors in Australia. He became Australian of the Year. Given that honor by the Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard, which I think there's some poetic justice in. <laughs> Here is Tim Flannery taking on the fossil fuel industry, condemning the use of, well, coal burning. And here is the prime minister who represents really everything Tim Flannery is speaking against, giving him the award and saying, Tim Flannery has introduced us to new ways of thinking. The history of Tim Flannery's books, I think, explains very much who he is. Beginning in 1994 with The Future Eaters, an ecological history of the Australasian lands and people. And then in 1998, Throw em Way Leg, Tree Kangaroos, Possums, and Penis Gourds on the Track of Unknown Mammals in Wildest New Guinea. Then there's the explorers, stories of discovery and adventure from the Australian frontier. The eternal frontier, an ecological history of North America and its peoples. Chasing kangaroos, a continent, a scientist, and a search for the world's most extraordinary creature. And finally, the weather makers, how man is changing the climate and what it means for life on Earth an urgent warning, and a call to arms. A book that documents Tim Flannery going from global warming skeptic to one of the most important global warming scientists, explaining not just in lay terms, but what is so powerful about Tim Flannery is his magnificent writing as he really documents where we have come from, the dire state we are in, but ultimately how hopeful he is, is what is so instructive. Tim Flannery believes we can come out of this mess. I'll end with David Suzuki, the award-winning scientist who says about this book, The Weathermakers, this is one of the most important books of this young century. Flannery leads us through the remarkable scientific elucidation of the factors shaping climate, the sun, atmosphere, oceans, and life itself. The scientific evidence of humanity's impact is indisputable, and this book convincingly pierces the phony economic, political, and pseudoscientific naysaying. It's an urgent call to action that we cannot afford to ignore. It is wonderful to see all of you coming out tonight. I only wish in the front row that the Bush administration, the cabinet members, that they were occupying these seats. Tim Flannery has something to teach them, all of us, tonight. I've been in the US now about 10 days. And uh, when I arrived, Al Gore had just received his um, Nobel Peace Prize, which I think is the greatest tribute um, that that, that, that any human being can receive. To me, it is the great, the great award. And I'm not an American, but I was so proud of him just as a fellow human being to be honoured in that way. And yet, um, a few days, uh, well, within a few days of my, my arriving, I saw the newspapers were full of this sort of sniping at this great man and wondered about it and thought, it's not, 
it, it doesn't do the, 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 the skeptics any, uh, any great justice. Um, and it, I think it's, it's just disturbing that someone who has done so much for the world uh, could be treated in that way. But in any case, one of the people who, who was uh, having a bit of a shot at uh, Al Gore was a man called Dr. William Gray. And he spoke at the University of North Carolina within just a couple of days of me speaking. And one of the things that he said to his audience was that he said the human impact on the atmosphere is just too small to have a major effect on global temperatures. And those sort of assertions really need to be, be tackled and, and explained because so many people just accept that from a, a professor as, as a given and accept it as a credible sort of statement. So tonight I'd really like to just have you reflect upon that statement a little bit as I talk and try to explain to you the way the atmosphere works, the nature of this problem, and what is actually happening to our world uh, right now. A really uh, useful starting point in trying to think about the whole climate problem is just to conceptualise it as a pollution problem. After all, these greenhouse gases are, are pollutants in our atmosphere. Even the US Supreme Court earlier in this year ruled that the principal greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, uh, should be considered as a pollutant. It's a very, very important step uh, in terms of our uh, dealing with this issue, incidentally. But I like to think about the climate problem as a pollution problem for a particular reason, and that is that, that us humans, I reckon, have become really, really good at dealing with pollution problems. I worked for many, many years in remote parts of Papua New Guinea and the Pacific Islands and stayed in villages that were well outside government control and those villages might only have had half a dozen grass huts and the people who lived in them may still have been living a Stone Age type of existence. But those villages were kept immaculately clean because people just know that if you let rubbish build up around your village, your health will be compromised and eventually it will be to your great detriment. You know, the first villages, the first human settlements that remained in the one place were, were established around 10,000 years ago in the Middle East. And I think that we can look at the role of natural selection acting on our species for the last 10,000 years as being a real weeding out of the grubby among us, you know, because <laughs> presumably when we settled down in those first villages there was quite a few grubby people who didn't care about throwing their pollution around and a few who did. And evolution favoured those who did. Um, now those of you who have teenage kids may not believe me in this, but, but I really do think that evolution's done a great job of making us a neat and tidy species by and large. That has a really gut feeling, has an important and strong gut feeling about pollution. We, we just know in our hearts it's wrong to, to allow our environment to become full of filth. There's been times in, in our history when uh, it looks, it's looked as if maybe filth would overwhelm us because population has grown and industrial process has changed. One of the times that I, th I can think of that uh, really uh, makes that point was, was uh, Europe and particularly London in the early 19th century. You know, that was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It was a time when London was the largest city on our planet. And that city of a million or so people was entirely unsewered. I mean, I can't imagine what a city of a million people would be like without a sewage system, but uh, you know, there are written accounts of what it was like and uh, some people record walking down the street and looking in cellars and finding that the cellars of the houses were ceiling high in, in you know what. I won't ruin your dinners, but it was pretty gruesome. And as a result of those, that, that the build-up of that waste, um, human health was compromised in London. Uh, cholera, for example, was just an endemic disease. It was around all the time. At that stage uh, of, of medical development, people believed that cholera was spread through the air. And it was a great surprise when a doctor did a proper epidemiological study in London and revealed the astonishing news that cholera, in fact, was spread through dirty water, specifically through sewerage getting in to uh, water that people drink. And this was an enormous challenge to the people of the day. Uh, the doctors, of course, didn't like it because they didn't like it being proved to be wrong. And neither did the wealthy citizens of London because that knowledge carried with it an important implication. Uh, of course, it was the poor people of London who were getting cholera. They were the ones forced to drink the filthy water. The rich, the wealthy, could bring their water in from elsewhere. But who was going to pay for the sewering of London, cleaning up the city? It wasn't the poor, it was those relatively few wealthy citizens. And the issue was debated back and forth for a couple of decades, really, as to what should be done. 